Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone is doing well. I know it's a crazy time around the country between COVID and snowstorms. So I'm hoping everybody is staying dry and enjoying themselves. And I hope all your families are safe. Uh, welcome to another uh, Accelerator um, Q&A with entrepreneurs. And I'm very excited to tackle some of the questions that we're seeing today. So let me go with the first one. Uh, the uh, question is from Gabor uh, Race. And Gabor asked, how do I keep track of what everyone's doing in my growing team? And uh, the description of the business is, not long ago, our company consisted of my parents and I plus a secretary. We now have three full-time and four, four part-time employees doing packaging and admin, three to five contractors working on marketing and many more content production. Some work in our office, others are remote. One of the employees works as a manager of the admins and reports to me while I directly manage everyone who works on marketing. I'm getting very stressed because I feel I'm losing track of what everyone should be doing. When I finally sit down to do my own job, I'm worried I've got all these guys on payroll and I'm not sure whether they're getting work done. How do I make sure my employees are productive and getting the right work done without micromanaging them and constantly looking over their shoulder? So it's really a big change that you're going through right now as you are managing people maybe for the very first time. So what I like to do is I um, have and would suggest that you do is have um, one minute or five minute meetings every morning and have everybody just quickly talk about what they're working on that day and what they accomplished the day before. So everybody is in line and, and using something like Zoom, since you're all probably in different locations because of COVID, or as you mentioned, some of your people are not in the same location. So I would definitely do a, a Zoom call or some type of call, and I would do it first thing every morning. So you might do it at 8 a.m. or 8.30, whenever your business opens, before you start working with customers, I would have everybody come on and do maybe 15 minutes. Everybody go around, talk about what they're working on. So not only are you informed about what's going on, but all of your colleagues and their colleagues know what's happening as well. And if anybody has any suggestions, they're able to do that. Also, it won't feel like you're micromanaging to them if everybody comes on and talks about what their day looks like and the challenges they're having and what they might need help with, or if, they can offer help to somebody else. So if I were you, I would just do these um, month uh, daily meetings in the morning. And then you can also have them send reports, uh, just a quick email at the end of every week and say, tell me you know, what you were assigned to do and tell me what's been accomplished, what hasn't been accomplished and anything that you're struggling with. Because sometimes People don't want to say they're struggling in front of other people in the group because they're afraid that they'll look bad. So do the 15 minutes every morning, ask people to file something at the end of every week, and you can structure it by having them go online like, um, like a, a Google share and have everybody put in what they're working on and what they've accomplished that particular week. Good thing for technology that we have this technology, it makes it easily available to them. So the next question is from Law Jackson. Law's background uh, and question are, thanks to uh, eight months of mentorship, I have a basic sales process, a short list of vendors, and a project manager in training. I thought sales was my biggest problem. Then I thought it was my limited capacity. Now I know it's my poor system of processes. I'm figuring out my process from sales through to production. It's not perfect, but it works. The real pain is removing myself from the different stages and still getting quality results. You may remember that I'm transitioning away from freelancer mode. It's still pretty much just me. I have a loose plan with a hundred little things to do each week. What are some of the ways to implement process, improve my ability to delegate, and develop sales. Do you have, think an accountability group would help? 
First of all, I like writing everything down, all the steps that I have to go through to do whatever I'm doing. So if it's sales, I like to write everything down that I need to do for sales, along with the script that I plan to use for those sales, so both for verbal script and a written script that I might send out in emails uh, to people. If I were you, I would also go and put together a process, write out the entire process of what you go through to deliver your product or service. So that way you can see if everything is moving along smoothly and who impacts each of those parts, not just yourself, but anybody else who comes along the chain, including your client. So I would put the process for sales. I put the process for delivering the product, see if there's any holes in it. And then after that, I would go and take a look at and talk to my clients and find out if we're falling down anywhere. Is there anything that we could be doing better? Do they notice anything we can do better? And if you're using outside contractors that are helping you, asking them for their input would be of great help to you. You also ask about, should you uh, join a group that um, works on your accountability? So there's a lot of uh, these different groups like Vistage out there that you could go and join. Of course, I guess we can help you with that as well. Um, but I, I think if, if you're not a disciplined person, then you're probably not gonna be successful in business anyway. And so I don't know that you need to have somebody hold you accountable for that. I think if you have more structure in what you're doing, that definitely is going to help you. So again, when you write things out, it kind of reinforces things for you. So that's why I think writing it out would be of great help, help to you. Um, Bob Guerre, and I hope I pronounced that uh, name right, he said, how do you know when to call it quits on a business idea? Over the past decade, I've launched five to six businesses, set up e-commerce sites, obtained sales, and stopped when I didn't believe I could turn a profit. Now with my current venture, I'm in the same spot and I'm not sure if I should push forward or switch gears to one of my other entrepreneurial ideas. Over the past two years, I've developed a skincare and massage product and I'm looking to build a brand and company around it. First of all, you have to take a look at the industry you're in and look at how long the uptake is going to be before you can start seeing whether people are embracing your product or service and how long that's typically going to take. So, you know, if you were opening, well, in, in this particular case, you have a skincare product and a massage product. So if you go and do an email blast and you notice that very few people are responding to it, then you have to look at the messaging. If you've looked at the messaging and you finally find a message that resonates, then you're looking at the price. But there's a lot of different things that you need to put on your checklist to see if in fact this idea is good or not before you go and give up on it. All too often, people come up with ideas, they, they build the e-commerce site, they launch it, then if there's not instant gratification, then they quit. You can't do that. You have to have some stick to itiveness and you have to focus on it and know that nothing happens overnight. I got a new venture myself called Funding Organizer and it's a common app for people to apply for commercial loans. I just launched it uh, this month and I told my partner, it's going to take us six months to a year to see if in fact this is really going to work. But in the first 90 days, we're going to see uh, pretty early if in fact people really want it or not want it. Usually with any product or service, you can tell in the first 60 or 90 days if people are embracing it. If you really believe in the product and it doesn't happen the first 60 or 90 days, then you have to take a look at how you're messaging it, what the pricing looks like. If you start to see people actually taking a look at it and they're not buying, then you have to go and maybe try to reach out to those people and find out why aren't they buying this product or service. If you see there's no interest in this, then maybe you thought it was a good idea, but nobody else thought it was a good idea. But before you throw in the towel with anything, the best thing to do is take the time to go and send out emails, collect information, contact people, see if um, people are interested. You know, on, uh, 
what is the sur survey monkey you can actually go and pay to survey people to find out if in fact they'd be interested in your product or service and at the price point you can ask a variety of different questions and that could be extremely helpful to you in fact i think that's a good way to go especially in your case when you're offering a consumer product uh, company and service a consumer product and service i think it's a good idea to maybe survey the market and see if they like the idea and if they're willing to buy it also you could go and do surveys if your product or service is just regional you can go out there and just do a regional survey and see you could use your facebook to go and do that you can use linkedin to do that so there's a variety of things that you can go and do but don't just start an idea and if it doesn't take hold right away don't throw up your hands walk away and start the next thing uh, because I think maybe you're the type of person that he loves the idea of the romance of it. And then once it comes to the actual commitment and you're being married to the uh, product or service, then you get bored with it and decide you want to move on to something else. So just like relationships, there has to be a certain level of commitment and you have to give it a certain amount of time before you decide to walk away and start something else. And and based on what you told me, you've done like five of these different ventures and you can't be wrong in all five of those more than likely. You could be wrong in a couple of them. But if in fact you have a good idea and people are immediately jumping on it, great. I mean, I'm finding now with my funding organizer that every bank I'm talking to says, oh my God, this is a great idea. We want to participate. So I know I have something. Now I have to twist the dials to make sure I got the right price and give them the right level of service to make sure that we're going to be successful. The next uh, question comes from Mary uh, Rantacalio. Rantacalio. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing this name. She writes, how do I determine how to pay someone to do work for me? Uh, I have a therapy machine for horses and have found and I have now found a person to hire to use it. What would be the best salary alternative? Hourly paid or per treatment? One treatment is 30 minutes and minimum charge is $50. The person knows a lot of people and is located in a training center for horses and there's a demand right away. I'm a veterinarian currently working with small animals as a contractor, uh, permanent resident sponsoring process going on. So here is what I would do if I were you. I might give them a small, you know, maybe like a minimum wage type of thing and also give them part of the sale, so like a commission. And you have to think about how many hours a week are they gonna work? How big a market is this? How many horses could they go and do? Because it has to be enough business that they either can make a part-time salary because maybe that's all they're interested in or full-time. If they're not making enough money in either of those areas, they're going to walk away and do something else. And one of the things you do not want to be doing is spending your time constantly training people to learn your business and to learn this service. Because every time you do that, it's costing you a lot of money to go and train them on this and then find out if it works. So you want to go and create a spreadsheet, look at how many uh, horses that you could do in a week and how big is the market for doing this? You know, do you draw a circle and know it's within an hour's drive time? If you know it's within an hour's drive time and you know from your own vet practice and other vet, vet, vets in the area's practice that there are X number of horses available and that they need this treatment um, once a week, once every other week, once a month, once you create that spreadsheet and know how big your market is, how much revenue you could bring in, then you could go and figure out, should I go and charge that, uh, pay them minimum wage along with a, you know, a piece of every transaction? Maybe they're willing to work just for a piece of every transaction and we have some kind of 60-40 split where you get 60%, they get 40%, or you're gonna do a, uh, a split where after the expense of the actual product is used, because let's say that you're charging $50 and the cost of keeping this machine and everything going is 25. So essentially 
you have a $25 profit margin. And if you need to go and make a certain amount yourself, so maybe you decide, well, you know what? If I can make $12.50 per each transaction, I can do a split of uh, $12.50 with the other person. Because even on $50, we're really only making $25 because the cost of paying back the machine, keeping it operating and everything, is essentially costing $25 of the $50 for every time that we go and do this. So I would definitely uh, take a look at a combination of paying them hourly and then a, a commission on each one. And, and also, are you just using them to service the customer or are you also looking them to bring in new customers? So you have to decide how is that going to work as well? Because if you're looking for them to also call people, but if you're looking for them just as the technician actually delivering the service and you're doing the marketing and the sales of it, then maybe you're paying them by the hour. Or again, maybe you are just saying to them, out of every $50 that we get, I'm going to pay you $10. Now, also don't know how long does the treatment uh, last because I see it's uh, 50 oh it's 30 minutes one treatment is 30 minutes uh, with a minimum charge of $50 so um, they can make a pretty decent amount of money if in fact there's a lot of volume here so go ahead and take a look at the volume put together a spreadsheet see how big this could possibly be and you'll be able to back into the number that you need to give them whether it's an hourly rate a part a sharing of a commission or commission an hourly rate, you'll be able to see it. But first, create that spreadsheet and see how big the opportunity is and how much money you believe you'll bring in. And also, you can call all the folks that you'd be taking care of and ask them how often they would use this. So if you had five different people on horses and they each own four horses each, and they all said we would be using this on a weekly basis, then you'll be able to come up with the number the numbers that you'll need in order to make uh, the right decision here. Good luck with that. Sounds like a great product idea, and especially since you're a veterinarian, you have great contacts. The next question is from Brandon Phillips. Uh, Brandon says, uh, my name is Brandon. I own two-man uh, HVAC company. I'm an active member of BNI, and I rely solely on word-of-mouth referrals for new business. We are grateful for the work received, but we also, but, but also ready to grow the business and take it to the next level. At this point, we could easily handle more work. After 16 months in business, I'll admit every dollar counts. Any feedback or advice on how we should approach advertising is very much appreciated. Uh, and what type of advertising should we start with when selling directly to homeowners? So you could run Facebook ads and run it for the region. You could run Google ads and run it for your particular region because obviously you don't really care about somebody who's maybe more than an hour drive time for you. So I would do Facebook ads. I would do Google ads. I would um, post on Facebook. I would post on Instagram. And I would also post on LinkedIn. And so you can reach as many people as possible. And I would probably do the postings before I would buy the ads. And then I would also maybe buy a uh, email list of homeowners in your area and send them uh, emails and also maybe flyers. There are, um, there are organizations that allow you to put coupons into an envelope and they get and they go to homes and those homes see those coupons and they're able to do that. The other thing you might do is there might be people who just sell H air conditioning systems, but maybe don't, they don't service them and they could utilize you as a partner to go and service them. Or maybe there are uh, folks who are contractors that have a lot of uh, clients and that they could introduce you to those clients and there could be some kind of revenue share with them because I'm sure as a contractor, you're only getting paid for what you actually do, just like you do. But if they could go and make an additional amount of money, that would be great. Maybe there are realtors that can make recommendations for you. And those realtors could say to especially new homers, come in. If you don't have an HVAC guy, I have somebody who would be great for you. And then you could give them a little piece of each of those transactions as well. 
And frankly, if you're able to work with realtors and they keep recommending you in, and let's say out of every hundred dollars that you go and make, that you give them ten dollars, and all of a sudden now they you have a hundred clients, and every time that you service them, they're getting a piece, ten percent of everything that you're doing on an ongoing basis. Wow all of a sudden now they have a real vested interest because they feel like they're a partner with you. And now they're gonna be incented to constantly think of you. If you just ask him for the referral, really what's in it for them? Why should they think about you? So again, I would go and talk to realtors in the area and try to incentivize them. I would talk to contractors in the area. I would send out emails to all of my friends asking them to think about you with anybody that they know it owns a home and has uh, an HVAC uh, system. I would also go and post on Facebook, like every time that you do something, you might take a picture, but not mention the home that you went to because the homeowner probably won't appreciate it, but anything special you've done uh, to, uh, or anything significant that you tackled or anything new that you're offering. Like, let's say that you're offering uh, a yearly uh, fee for automatic maintenance to their HVAC system. And I don't know, it didn't say in here if in fact you were going after small businesses, but if you were, you might contact janitorial services and see if they would like to recommend you in and, and they would get also an ongoing revenue stream for you. So I think any of those things would be in a low cost ways for you to have other people being evangelists for your business and helping you get out there. Our next question is from Alicia Francis. What in your opinion, what is your opinion on holding companies? Do you currently use them and with your business? What are the pros and cons? We operate a service based company. In the winter, we do snow removal, so there's some risk of being sued if someone were to slip and fall. We have a business insurance, of course, but we've been told a holding company can also help protect your business. We are considering starting a holding company to hold all of our equipment so any type of litigation with our operating company wouldn't affect our assets. So this is more or less a question for a, an attorney a corporate attorney to talk to about this because if you are an LLC, they can only go and sue the business and they can't sue you personally uh, for this. But if you go and, and have a couple different businesses, so let's say one is actually doing the snow removal but doesn't own any equipment, you could go and do that, but that means now you're filing tax returns for both of these. You're buying insurance for both of these you are creating LLCs for both of these. And that means like if you were like in my town in Philadelphia, you'd be paying Philadelphia taxes, you'd be paying uh, state taxes, you'd be paying federal taxes and having to file for each of them. It makes sense if you're a large company that you go and do that because you're looking for tax advantages for doing it. It's not just the idea of protecting, but if you have insurance, and you also have the right incorporation, there really is no reason to go and do that. That all being said, every state is different with the liability issues. So you should contact an attorney in your area and ask them for their advice on this. And you might contact your local chamber of commerce for recommendations of attorneys who would know something about this type of thing. You would also contact your accountant and ask your accountant what they might recommend about this and also an insurance broker uh, would also be helpful in this. So there are a few different groups that you would contact to get their input and then you'd find out if in fact that made the most sense for you. But if you're really running a real small business, I think between the incorporation and your insurance uh, package, it's probably enough to cover you for anything like that. And, and more than likely, unless it's really catastrophic, uh, they're going to depend on the insurance. They're not going to liquidate your equipment because your equipment devalues so quickly that there's really no use in suing and trying to get you to sell your equipment. So I, I, I myself wouldn't worry about it, but again, please talk to attorneys. The last question for today is from Paulina Beck. Paulina says, I run a full service accounting firm and I think I'm potentially undercharging my clients for CFO services. 
My clients fall between $100,000 and $500,000 in revenue, and my monthly CFO retainer, I cover bookkeeping, tax prep, tax planning, cash flow analysis, financial consulting, with four meetings during the month for $750. Actually, I don't think that fee sounds unreasonable. You may be able to get a thousand, but again, it depends on where you're located uh, and what part of the country. Because if you're located in Idaho, which uh, costs are much less, somebody probably it may not pay more than a thousand dollars a month. Also depends on how many hours you're actually spending doing this. So you need to look at how many hours it takes to deliver this and figure out what you would like to make per hour to do it. So let's say that you say to yourself, you know what, I, I need to make $50 an hour. So look at how many hours you're giving them for $750 and see if that makes sense. And don't forget when you calculate this, you have to calculate if you're driving, which probably now you're not because of COVID, but if you were driving, how much time does it take you to get to that client? How much time does it take you to get back to client because you're not doing anything during that period? How much time does it take you to prepare to go and meet with that client? And how long does it take you to do all the different things that you're doing and create a spreadsheet uh, for all of these different things. So mark down time for preparation, mark down time for travel, mark down time to come back, mark down time for calls that you might do with them. Put all of that time in together, see how much time you're actually giving them and then uh, say to yourself, how much do I want to make an hour uh, in my business? And if you decide it's $50, $75, whatever that number is, and also take a look at what other people are charging in your area for CFO services. And it doesn't have to be exactly in your town. Maybe it's a town over. Maybe it's an hour away if, in fact, uh, the, the cost of living is relatively the same. Again, you have to take a look of what those things are. I used to go and charge $15,000 to develop a business plan. I was constantly busy in New York uh, doing plans because they were used to paying $25,000 for a plan. So me charging $15,000 was a no brainer to them. I felt I was making good money and they felt like, oh my God, it's a great deal for all the experience that this guy has. Could I have been charging a little bit more? Probably so. Uh, but in Philadelphia, charging $15,000 for a plan, people were thinking about that. So, you know, sometimes I could only charge $10,000 uh, for a business plan. Again, it all depends on the region, the industries that you're dealing with, how many hours you're putting in. So there's a lot of factors that go into this, but certainly you should create a spreadsheet and make sure you count all the time you're gonna put into this not just the actual time that you did the work or the actual time you met the person. There's a lot of prep that goes in to when any time you're working uh, with a company and it sounds to me like you're providing some really terrific uh, services for them. And again, 750 is not a bad number to go and apply because if this is essentially one day's worth of work, um, 750 may not be bad. Again, depending on where you live. Well, I hope all of you have a great and wonderful and safe day. It was a pleasure speaking to all of you. I look forward to the next set of questions. I hope all of you have a great end of year, a happy new year. I hope all your families stay safe. And I look forward to speaking to you in 2021. Take care.